I am not scared. I am not scared. I am not scared. You are scared. I am not scared. Are you? No, I am brave. This will be fun. You look scared. Well, maybe a little. Don't worry. There are much scarier things than this. Like what? Like snakes. Snakes? Yes, they are scary. Or what about a tub of hairy spiders? Now that is scary. Or a pit of hot lava. A pan of fried ants. An alien with pink eyes and furry teeth. A roller coaster. Ah, with a snake. <laughs> Let's be scared together. Uh, okay. Was scary. <sighs> the scariest. We are scary. Corn and horse. This is unicorn. And this is horse. Unicorn is a unicorn. And horse is, well, not. Unicorn has a sapphire horn, a silver coat, a rainbow mane, and perfect white teeth. Horse does not. Unicorn eats pink cupcakes for every meal. Horse does not. Unicorn makes rainbows. Horse makes something else. Oh. Unicorn dances. Tra la la. Horse sits grumpy. Blah, blah, blah. Unicorn prances. Ha, ha, ha. Horse looks frumpy. Pa, pa, pa. Unicorn makes everything cheery. <laughs> Really cheery. Horse oh, does not. Of course, all the animals love unicorn. He has a horn for squirrel to play ring toss. Bird lines her nest with his long, beautiful hair. And everyone loves Yum. sharing his cupcakes. Won't you join us, horse? said Unicorn. 
No, I don't like you, said Horse. But what he meant was, <laughs> I wish I were you. Unfortunately, not everyone who heard about Unicorn was a happy or unhappy animal. A rainbow dancing unicorn who eats cupcakes for breakfast could make someone a lot of money! <laughs> One night while everyone was asleep, two men crept into Unicorn's paddock. Quietly as they could, they tied a startled unicorn in ropes and loaded him into the back of their truck. Then... They were off! The other animals awoke when they heard the truck. Hurry! They're stealing Unicorn! But uh, I can't run fast enough to catch them, said Squirrel. And I can't fly fast enough, cried Bird. I can't run on the road, said Fox. And... I can't run at all, said Turtle. Only one animal could. Horse thought, and thought, and thought. Then he ran. Great chomps of horses' large teeth. Unicorn was free! Thank you, said Unicorn. You're welcome, said Horse. <laughs> this is Horse. And this is Unicorn. Sometimes horse eats cupcakes. And sometimes unicorn eats hay. Sometimes horse makes rainbows. And sometimes unicorn does not. Horse likes races. Unicorn likes ring toss. But most of all, they like each other. Horse and Unicorn are friends, and that's better than anything. <laughs> Even pink cupcakes. something different. He has heard of a magical place called Sock City, where every day is a new adventure. 
the only way to get to Sock City is through a secret tunnel in the back of the dryer. <gasps> Late one night, Little Sock sneaks out of the drawer <gasps> and climbs into the tunnel. <gasps> the tunnel is very dark. And very scary. <laughs> but Little Sock is brave. Hmm. Finally, he sees a light at the end of the tunnel. Oh. Big socks? No. And tiny socks. Oh. <laughs> New socks? Oh, hello. Old socks. Oh, hello. Sporty socks? Here. <laughs> <laughs> That socks. <laughs> and even smelly socks. Oh, yeah! So many different socks doing different things. Every day is a new adventure. Sock had the best time in Sock City. Mm. He can't wait to go back again. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> bring a friend. <laughs> oh, let's go! to sleep. He sneaks out of the drawer and into a hidden tunnel in the back of the dryer. This leads to a place where only socks can go. by yourself. Little Sock 
wonders. Could she be my friend? Oh, here you go. Mm. Little Sock starts to worry. How do I make a new friend? Would she be a good friend? Will she want to play with me? Want a friend like me? <gasps> Will she think I'm fun? Huh? Little Sock is nervous, <laughs> but he tries to be brave. <sighs> Little Sock takes a deep breath. Little Sock asks. Will you be my friend? Hmm. Sure. Hooray! <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> Let's go play. <laughs> In Sock City, there are so many fun things to do. Things you can do by yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> and other things are just better with a friend. Making new friends is fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for playing with me. See you next time. Where are you? By Jonathan Sunday. Where are you? Lounging in my nook, reading a good book. Where are you? Sitting on a cinder block, knitting me a winter sock. Where are you? Having a yummy plump plum with my lumpy stump chum. <laughs> Where are you? Riding George the gorgeous porpoise past enormous surging orcas. Where are you? Getting ready to slurp spaghetti with Freddy Gazzetti, the sweaty yeti. <laughs> Where are you? Riding on the back of a giraffe gone quackers while snacking on a pack of alpaca shaped crackers. Where are you? Surfing on a blue spruce with old Rusty McDoose, but my trusty goose noose feels a wee bit loose. <laughs> Loof? Where are you, Goof? Is? I'm here in this box, safe from hard knocks. Do you want to come play? Not right now. I'm afraid. We could snack on the way. I think I'll just stay. Oh. 
If the here where you are isn't the where that you want, don't sit where you are feeling glum on your bum. Get up and start working to change where you're from. Cause bruises and gooses and fears and excuses can't stop you from living the life that you choose, Is? Is? Where are you? Oh, sorry for skipping the end of your speech. Had to rescue an Eskimo lost on the beach. Then I wrote a hit song about butternut squashes. Now I'm testing some specs on my rocket galoshes. Woohoo! Thanks for the boost. The end. Ghost Afraid of the Dark One Halloween, and this tale is true, there once was a ghost, and his name was Boo. Boo carved pumpkins. He loved trick or treat. He liked to have fun and parade in the street. October nights should have been such a lark, but poor little Boo was afraid of the dark. Boo stamped his foot. He yowled and he glared. It just wasn't right for a ghost to be scared. Uh, I need some help, he said with a groan. It's really too hard to be brave on my own. So he decided to go visit a few friends. Boo went to see Witch, who was stirring a spell. She gazed in her cauldron and breathed in its smell. I can't work by day. I make such a stink. It's better when people are sleeping, I think. The dark is our friend. Don't fear the night. Make spells with me until it gets light. Boo went to see Frank, who was having a ball. He skipped and he boogied all down the hall. I can't dance by day. People would giggle. But when it gets late, I just want to wiggle. The dark is our friend. Don't fear the night. Dance here with me until it gets light. Dracula's house was only next door. When Drac swished his cape, his feet left the floor. I can soar by day. There's no fun in that. The night is the time I turn into a bat. The dark is our friend. Don't fear the night. Come fly with me until it gets light. Werewolf was waiting bushy and hairy. He didn't think that the darkness was scary. I can't howl by day. It's really too soon. I need to stand in the glow of the moon. The dark is our friend. Don't fear the night. Shout out with me until it gets light. Ah! Last, 
Boo saw Mummy, all ready to go. Wrapped up in white, from his head to his toe. I can't walk by day with bandages trailing. People would trip and then they'd start wailing. The dark is our friend. Don't fear the night. Dress up with me until it gets light. Boo floated home, his face full of smiles. This was the best time that he'd had by miles. The dark is my friend. I don't fear the night. I had so much fun until it got light. It was my buddies that helped me to see. I'll throw them a party. A thank you from me. Boo closed the drapes. The house filled with gloom. He needed darkness for his party room. All of that day, he prepared for the eve, hiding all kinds of tricks up his sleeve. Along came the chums that Boo wanted to thank. Witch, Mummy, Drac, and then Werewolf and Frank. Hey, shouted Boo as he opened the door. Let's stay up late. This is no time to snore. The dark is our friend. Don't fear the night. Party with me until it gets light. Boo and his pals had a spooky old time with cobwebs and candy and pumpkins and slime. They made stinky potions. They learned how to fly. They dressed up in rags and they howled to the sky. The night was a hit, packed with wonder and thrills. put on music, and showed off his skills. The glitter ball turned, and the beat sounded thumpy. Boo's feet were skippy, and twirly, and jumpy. The monsters clapped, and sang Hey Diddle Diddle. And there was young Boo, dancing right in the middle. He got faster and faster. It was quite a show. Then all of a sudden, Boo started to glow. What a magical sight that little ghost made, shining and glowing in every shade. The rhythm was fun and the music was loud. But darkness had helped him stand out from the crowd. Being brave was not easy for scared little Boo, but he gave it a try, and look what he could do. Boo hadn't known. He'd never had warning. The little ghost shimmered until it was morning. And when it got time for the party to close, Boo gave a yawn and got ready to doze. The dark is the best. I love the night. Now let's snuggle up, cause here comes the light.
Ronnie and his grit. Let me tell you a story about Ronnie Lott. When others gave up, Ronnie did not. Ronnie always did what he set his mind to, dedicated and tough, through and through. As a boy, he bought shoes that were red as fire. The commercial said they'd make him fly higher. So with all of his effort and all of his might, Ronnie prepared for his very first flight. But all his excitement and thrill didn't last. He jumped through the air, but came crashing down fast. It was after his unfortunate plunk of a tumble that Ronnie felt something inside start to rumble. He sat there a bit, somewhat battered and bruised, and brooded across from his new pair of shoes. Maybe these shoes won't make me jump high. Maybe it's me and how hard I try. That rumble in Ronnie is what we call grit. A voice that encouraged him, don't ever quit. Grit followed Ronnie as he grew and grew. Every time that he played or tried something new. He was skilled at sports and that helped him thrive. But grit always urged him, continue to strive. Grit had a voice that was strong and impactful, but Ronnie still needed to learn to be tactful. Like when his coach said, throw as hard as you can, and he knocked someone over. That wasn't the plan. Respect those around you, his dad would say. Ronnie listened and learned along the way. In high school, Ronnie joined the football team and suddenly knew that he had a dream. When he put on his helmet and all of his gear, he felt that same rumble. His purpose was clear. While he missed some tackles and dropped some balls, he never gave up or stopped giving his all. When he fell, Grit told him, get back up again. When he lost, Grit said, I know we can win. His mistakes were chances to try a new way. And tomorrow was always a brilliant new day. Years passed and he joined a professional team. Ronnie and his grit were achieving their dreams. Sometimes he got hurt, and sometimes his team lost. He kept doing his best, no matter the cost. One fateful day on the football field, he was put to the test, and his grit didn't yield. Ronnie got hurt. It was really a zinger. He arose from the play, losing part of his finger. But even that didn't stop him from reaching his dream and inspiring others 
including his team. Today, Ronnie's football days are past, but his grit stays strong and always will last. He continues to give everything his all, whether teaching kids or playing ball. Every time he helps inspire someone, every time he cheers on his daughters or sons, Grit is helping him follow through. Give this life all you've got. I believe in you. Have you listened closely to that voice deep inside? The one that's telling you never to hide? Next time you're down or feeling blue, remember that grit lives within you too. It's the whisper that says, yes, you can. Yes, you can. It's the belief in yourself. It's your greatest fan. It's never too late to call up your grit, your own tiny voice that rumbles. Don't quit. Kindergarten? Uh, well, don't worry, laddie. It be me first day as a bus driver. <laughs> Climb aboard. This here's Polly, me parrot. Say hello, Polly. <laughs> All these little scoundrels back there be ye new mates. But I be the captain of this here vessel. And I run me a tight ship. Er, I mean, bus. So, here be the rules. No getting out of ye seats. Mutiny! That's right, Polly. No yelling. Mutiny! Keep ye hooks. Er... I mean hands to ye self and always respect ye mates. So, is everybody back there ready for kindergarten? I miss my daddy. I miss my doggy. I miss my teddy. I miss my mommy. I miss my blankie. I'm scared. Arg! Pipe down, you little landlubbers. There'll be no blubbering on me bus. Pirates don't get scared. We eat bones for supper. And we don't miss nobody neither. Cause we're rough and we're tough. And we ain't got time for that fluffy stuff. Now, hold me map, boy. X marks the spot where ye school be. Oi, ho, ho, ho. To kindergarten we go. We be brave and tough and we have no fear. Cause that be the job of a buccaneer. Yo, ho, ho. To kindergarten we go. Shiver me timbers! We've got a rough seas, er, I mean rough road ahead. Puddle, 
Eagles. Yarg. As far as me eye can see. Batten down the hatches, me hearties. Here we go. me, Polly. Hey, I thought you said that pirates don't get scared. Yeah, and you said that pirates don't miss their mommies or doggies or anything either. <laughs> I was only horn swoggling. <laughs> I wanted ye to think I was brave, so ye would be brave too. I'm nothing but a scared, blubbering boob of a buccaneer. <laughs> well, my mommy says that being brave is when you're scared, but you still do what you have to do. Yeah! That's what my daddy says, too. Yeah! So, it be okay that I be scared? Yeah, everybody gets scared. Blimey! Well, I'll be a barnacle on the back of a blue-footed booby bird. Let's get ye little scallywags to kindergarten, then. Now, sing along, me hearties. Treasure of all treasures! Ahem! Ye be learning to read and write. Ye be playing games and making new mates. Ye be running around like scallywags during recess. Wouldn't leave me. I love ye, Polly. Now, all ye scoundrels walk the plank. Er, I mean, exit the bus. Bye. Go be having Bye. new kindergarten Bye. adventures. Bye. Uh, come on. If you're really a pirate, what are you doing driving a school bus? Arg. Because I gets seasick, boy. I gets seasick! <laughs> Luis and Tabitha. Luis was a cat about town, dashing, charming, perfectly suave. He lived unofficially at the fire station and had, since a daring rescue involving a very small Luis, a very shrill smoke alarm and a very tall house, 
his tail still had the scorch marks. Luis liked to go visiting, as society cats do. Sometimes he'd travel in the fire truck. Everywhere he went, Luis was welcomed with open arms and leftovers. One night, after too much catnip and too many sardines, Luis was making his rounds when he took a wrong turn. He climbed a wall and saw Tabitha. Elegant, silky, perfectly sophisticated. Luis stopped. Tabitha stared. It was love, love from afar. Love under the spotlight of the moon. Love thwarted by a thick glass door and by Tabitha's owner. Shoo, she cried, shoo. Luis shooed, but he wasn't done. The next morning, Tabitha stared out at a vast bouquet of sardine tins and twine and feathers. Luis smiled. Tabitha smiled. Tabitha's owner did not smile. Shoo, she cried, shoo. Luis shooed, but he wasn't done. The next day, he brought mice. The day after that, he brought pigeons. And after that, balloons, which is not easy when you're a cat. Each day, Luis and Tabitha stared into each other's eyes until Tabitha's owner chased Luis away. Luis needed advice. He asked his friends over a bowl of cream you're an outside cat, said Mr. Pickles. And you need to be an inside cat, said Socks. Or at least look like one, said One-Eyed Winky. Luis had an idea. The next day, Luis showed up at Tabitha's door once more. Luis smiled. Tabitha smiled. Tabitha's owner clutched her hands to her heart and opened the door. Luis was inside, where everything was soft and warm and scratchable. And Luis and Tabitha were inseparable. until the doorbell rang. Is this him? That's him. And Luis and Tabitha were thwarted by the thick glass door once more. Luis had a new home and a new name and a new owner. And all the sardines and cheese he could eat. But all he wanted was Tabitha. And all Tabitha wanted was Luis. It was love, love from afar. Love from far too afar. Then the doorbell rang. Is this him? That's him, and that's not him. And Luis was a cat about town once more. Luis needed advice. He asked his friends over a bowl of cream. You're an outside cat, said Mr. Pickles. 
And she's an inside cat, said Socks. And that's just the way it is, said One-Eyed Winky. So Luis went visiting, as society cats do. He went visiting all across town. Everywhere he went, he was welcomed with open arms and leftovers. And everywhere he went, Tabitha wasn't. Until... One night, Luis was riding in the fire truck when his tail began to tingle. Luis saw Tabitha, elegant, silky, perfectly sophisticated, and in terrible danger. The sirens began to wail. Everyone, outside, cried the firefighters. The crowd was a cloud of arms and shrieks as it gathered on the corner. But there was no Tabitha. And suddenly, there was no Luis. The crowd waited and worried and fretted. Finally, the gray parted and from it emerged Luis and Tabitha, leading Tabitha's owner. The crowd cheered. Tabitha's owner plopped down on the curb and clutched her hands to her heart. She looked at Luis and Tabitha and smiled. The cat show judge placed a blue ribbon on Tabitha and the firefighters placed a gold medal on Luis and declared them both perfectly heroic. Luis was back inside, where everything was soft and warm and scratchable. And Luis and Tabitha were inseparable. Punctuation came to town. A new family moved to Alphabet City. The Punctuations. Exclamation point led the way to their first day at a new school. Let's hurry! <laughs> he exclaimed, I can't wait to get there. We are going to have so much fun. Exclamation point was always excited about something. Question mark wondered what it would be like. Do you think everyone will be nice? Are we going the right way? Should we ask for directions? Period followed, bringing the line to a close. Let's go. I'll tell you when to stop. Comma kept pausing. Wait for me, please. When they walked into school, exclamation point, first forward. Hi, everyone! <laughs> the little letters stared. Who are you? They asked. You don't look like letters. <laughs> We're not letters, exclamation point explained. We're the punctuation family. Punctuation who? The letters were confused. I'm exclamation point! And this is question mark, comma, and period. We're different from letters, but we love being around words. The punctuations join the class. The letters worked to make words. Exclamation point, question mark, and period joined in the fun. Exclamation point added excitement to words. Wow! wow. Question
question mark asked a lot of questions. Ooh. Period brought each sentence to a tidy end. Stop! Stop. Kama tried not to get stepped on and fit in wherever he could. Uh, oh. <laughs> no. no. Why? Why? Go. <laughs> As the day wore on, Kama began to feel smaller and smaller. The letters love making words, but I just get in the way and keep them apart. He whispered to himself. <sighs> no one wants me here. When no one was looking, Kama snuck out the door. Yay. Inside the classroom, exclamation point was creating a great deal of excitement. Uh, yay! yay. <laughs> the letters were cheering and hurrying to make words. Shouldn't we quiet down? Question mark asked. <laughs> But no one heard her over the noise. The letters kept making words faster and faster and faster. Soon words were everywhere. There were so many words, they all became jumbled. Period hurried to stop them, but the letters tripped over her and collided. With a thundering crash, the letters fell one after another until they all tumbled through the door, spilling into the hall. Kama stared in shock. The letters were piled, the words all tangled. Exclamation point, question mark, and period ran into the hallway. They saw the heap of letters, and then they saw Kama. What are you doing out here? Question mark asked. I didn't think anyone wanted me around. Kama sighed. I just slow everything down. Kama, without you, things become a disaster! Exclamation point said, pointing to the pile of letters and words. Period nodded. Slowing things down is your job, and words need you. Didn't you know? When we're with words, we all have a job to do, question mark asked. I had excitement! <laughs> Exclamation point burst out. Have a question? Question mark asked. That's what I'm here for. And I put a stop to things. Period said. We're the punctuation family, and we all work together to help letters and the words they make. The punctuations help the letters back into the classroom. When the letters began making words again... Yes, yes please. please! Kama stood right in the middle. The letters looked confused. What are you doing? It's my job, Kama said. From now on, I'll help keep things in order. How? The letters asked. It was Kama's turn to explain. We all work together. Words need punctuation. And punctuation needs words. Snack time! Let's, Let's eat letters! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Let's eat letters! letters. quiet colour. He enjoyed looking up at the sky. Oh!
floating on the waves. Mm -hmm. And on days he felt daring, splashing in rain puddles. <laughs> Every once in a while, he wished he could be more sunny, like yellow, lovely to meet you, or bright, like green, ta-da! More regal, like purple, oh yes, oh, lovely, or outgoing, like orange, hey -o! But overall, he liked being blue. <sighs> Except when he was with Red. Ha! <laughs> Red was a hothead. <laughs> he liked to pick on blue. <sighs> Red is a great colour, he'd say. Red is hot. Blue is not. Then... Blue would feel bad about being blue. <laughs> Sometimes yellow comforted blue. Blue is a very nice colour, she'd say. But yellow never said that in front of red. She never said, Stop picking on blue! Green, purple and orange thought blue was nice too. But they never told Red to stop either. Um, oh, 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 mm. Every time Red said something mean and no one spoke up, he got bigger <laughs> and bigger <sighs> and bigger. Soon Red grew so big that everyone was afraid of him. <laughs> no one dared stop him. Red picked on all the colours. Then everyone felt a little blue. <sighs> Until one came. <clears throat> He had a different shape, with bold strokes and squared corners. He was funny. He made the colours laugh. <laughs> Red saw this and got very hot. Stop laughing, he told Yellow. Stop laughing, he told Green. Stop laughing, he told Purple and Orange. <laughs> and they did. Red rolled up to one. Stop laughing, he told him. But one stood up straight, like an arrow, and said, No! Red was mad. But one wouldn't budge. So Red rolled away. One turned to the colours and said, If someone is mean, and picks on me, I, for one, stand up and say, no. Then Yellow felt brave and said, me too. <gasps> Green agreed and said, me three. Oh. Then purple became four Oosh. and orange became five. Oh. Blue saw the colours change. He wanted to count. Oh. 
Red grew red hot. Ah, he felt left out. He grew hotter and hotter and hotter. Red raced over to Blue and said what he always did. Red is hot. Blue is not. But this time, Blue stood up tall and became six. <gasps> Red can be really hot, he said. But Blue can be super cool. Red blew a fuse. <laughs> and tried to roll over Blue. <laughs> but everyone took a stand and said, No! Seeing them standing tall made Red feel very, very, very small. <gasps> then Red turned even redder and began rolling away. <laughs> Blue called out, Can Red be hot? And blue be cool? Red stopped in his tracks. Red can count two, said one. Red rocked and rolled and turned into... Seven! <laughs> ah! Everyone counts! They shouted. <laughs> then Red laughed and joined the fun. Yay! Sometimes it just takes one. <laughs> right on. Oh, oh, Save the day? The letter A sat by a frog and chatted with a duck and dog. <laughs> Until the letter B swept by, a wicked twinkle in his eye. There are five vowels in your group, but 21 in our grand troop. I'm a more important letter. Consonants are so much better. <laughs> A knew it only took one hand to count the members in her band. Consonants need all the toes and all the fingers plus a nose. The letter B stuck out his tongue and bragged, Our group is number one! <gasps> Ooh. Offended, A said, You'll regret when all the vowels are gone, I bet. Then poof, like that, A disappeared. That's when things got a little weird. Instead of bark, the dog said, Burk, 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 burk. burk. 
and the duck couldn't quack. She could only cook. Cook, cook. And the frog, poor thing, he couldn't croak. He could only crock. That woeful bloke. Crock, 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 crock. The horse laughed. Nay, who needs the A? And turned his back to eat some hay. But then E said, I'm going to. You're being rude. I don't like you. <laughs> so E took off. Things went awry, and all the horse could say was, Nigh! 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 Twit! 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 The birds sang twit instead of tweet. And the sheep just blot instead of bleat. But, but, but. <laughs> now mean old B just whooped and roared as C through Z laughed in accord. <laughs> Insulted, young I spun her dot and soared off like an astronaut. Turning back, she waved goodbye, and the horse just hung his head to cry. Was all that he could utter. Onk. Was all the pig could mutter. Onk. 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 <laughs> The cow cracked up beside the bunny. They thought it was all too funny. So they sat and watched the fun. As A, E, I left one by one. But wouldn't you know the next to go? would be the cow's lone vowel. Oh! Mmm! Was all that she could say when O decided not to stay. The pigeons, too, they couldn't coo. K was all that they could do. And rooster, I bet you can guess. K doodle, duh, he said, distressed. K doodle, duh. K doodle, duh. <laughs> the consonants were so absorbed in laughing that they all ignored. A tractor speeding toward their crowd. Fast asleep, ahead it plowed. Only you and B observed the tractor as it swung and swerved. Zzz, it snoozed and snored away, gaining speed to B's dismay. He tried to shout in fear, but stoop was all the world could hear. Stoop, stoop. And when he tried to scream, watch out! Which oot was all that he could spout. Which oot, which oot. Determined, B jumped to his feet 
and vaulted to the tractor's seat. This was a test. B couldn't flunk. B pushed the horn. The horn went hunk. <gasps> So no one heard, no one cared. B turned to you, a plea prepared. But vowelless words wouldn't flow. So B's unease began to grow. Calmly, you held up her hand. She could make B understand. That yes, indeed, their group was small, but with no vowels, words will stall. So up that you jumped strong and high, reaching straight up toward the sky. She bent her arms above her head and turned into an O instead. When she did, that horn could sound. Honk! The warning shook the ground. Honk! The tractor woke with the alert and stopped in time. No one was hurt. You turned toward the consonants, nodded with some confidence. And off she marched to make things right and help the letters reunite. Once A, E, I, O, U came back, the dog could bark, the duck could quack, the frog could croak. The birds could tweet. The horse could neigh. The sheep could bleat. The pig could oink. The cow could moo. The tractor honk. The pigeons coo. And what about the rooster? Yeah. He too could cock a doodle doodle do. Sheepishly, the letters shrugged, the consonants and vowels hugged. B said, Sorry, now we see the alphabet's a family. Then a steady voice said, Wait! I have one thing that I must state. <clears throat> At times, I feel left out, said Y. But you need me to say goodbye.
she put on her favorite blue tutu. Beatrice sat down for breakfast in the little kitchen, in the tiny apartment, in the gigantic city where she lived. With each spoonful, Beatrice thought more and more about what first grade would be like. What if my teacher isn't nice? What if I get lost? What if something goes wrong? You can't wear your tutu to school, Beatrice. You're not a kindergartner anymore, said Beatrice's brother. Beatrice had worn her blue tutu every day that summer. It was her favorite thing in the whole world. But she didn't want to stick out either. Beatrice took off her tutu and threw it in the toy bin. Hmm. Just then, out of the corner of her eye, Beatrice saw something move. Ah. <laughs> she looked up to find a tiny butterfly flying right through her window. Uh. Hi, said the butterfly. I'm Benjamin. I got lost in your garden, and I can't find my friends. May I stay with you until I find them? Beatrice couldn't bear the thought of the tiny butterfly all alone. And first grade wouldn't be so scary with a secret friend by her side. Of course! You can come with me to first grade! She said. Off Beatrice went to first grade, with Benjamin following close behind. The first day of first grade was going pretty well for Beatrice, until it was time for read aloud circle. Beatrice was confused about something the teacher had read, so she wanted to ask a question. But I'm afraid to sound silly, she whispered to Benjamin. What if one of your classmates has the same question? Be big! Raise your hand high! said Benjamin. So Beatrice raised her hand. Yeah. When it was time for arts and crafts, all the other children were busy working. All but Beatrice. I have an idea for a drawing. But I'm afraid it won't look right, she whispered to Benjamin. What if your drawing inspires others? Be big! Draw something you love, <laughs> said Benjamin. So Beatrice drew her blue tutu. On the playground, a few children were starting a game of leapfrog, and Beatrice wanted to play, too. But I'm afraid they won't want to play with me, she whispered to Benjamin. What if you're the person who would make the game complete? Be big! Jump into the leapfrog fun! said Benjamin. So Beatrice jumped in. The 
the first day of first grade was over. It turned out to be a very good day for Beatrice. Let's go home, Benjamin, Beatrice said. On their walk home, Beatrice noticed that Benjamin looked sad. What is wrong, Benjamin? Beatrice asked. I had a wonderful first day of first grade with you. But I miss my friends. Benjamin said just as he was interrupted by voices coming from the garden. <laughs> Look! You helped me find my friends! Said Benjamin. I am happy you found your friends! Beatrice said. Thank you for going to the first day of first grade with me, Benjamin. You are very welcome, Beatrice. I am glad you decided to be big today. Remember, it's okay to be afraid and be yourself anyway. Chances are, you're not alone. Benjamin said as he gave Beatrice a kiss goodbye. The next morning, Beatrice went to her second day of first grade wearing her blue tutu. Have you been big? What can you do to feel big? to play with. The other children in the neighborhood had lots of toys. Every afternoon, the boy would go to the park, sit under a big tree, and watch the other children play. Sometimes they let the boy play with their toys, sometimes not. This made the boy sad. One day, as the boy was sitting under the big tree in the park, he noticed a stick leaning against the trunk. He had never seen such an unusual stick. He picked it up. Suddenly, he was a pirate. Arg! Then a baseball player at bat. And then a knight on a steed. The boy noticed that there were words carved into the stick. He sang them like a song. Imagination lives in you. It's the fire in all you do. Use it well, and you can be anything you want to be. The boy carried the stick everywhere, and anywhere he was, he was anything he wanted to be. At the beach, he was a fisherman. At the lake, he paddled a canoe. He was a hiker in the highlands, and his imagination grew. 
Time passed, and the boy grew up. With the stick's inspiration, he became everything he wanted to be. He took business trips and airplane rides. He sailed the seas on rising tides. He gave of his time, he gave of his wealth, he gave from his heart, he gave of himself. He built a house high on a hill, overlooking the valley where he had grown up. In the distance, he could see the park and the old tree where he used to sit. As the years passed, the boy became an old man. But each day, he took his stick with him to the park and sat on a bench near the tree where he had found the stick so long ago. He would sit for hours and watch the children play. All of the children seemed to have lots of toys to play with, except for one little girl. The little girl always sat under the old tree and watched the other children play with their toys. This made the old man sad. Early one morning, the old man walked to the park, but instead of sitting on the bench, he went over to the tree. He leaned the stick against its trunk, walked to his bench, and waited. Soon, the children arrived at the park with their toys. He waited to see if the little girl would show. He saw her walk slowly toward the tree. She peered down at the unusual stick leaning against its trunk. She picked up the stick and suddenly, she was a princess. A fencer. Then a surfer riding a wave. She noticed that there were words carved into the stick, and as she danced away, she sang them like a song. Imagination lives in you. It's the fire in all you do. Use it well, and you can be anything you want to be. And the old man smiled and walked home. The Boy Who Grew a Forest. The True Story of Jadav Paying. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is now. Proverb. In India, on a large river island, among farms and families, hard at work, there lived a boy who loved trees. Trees meant shade, food, and shelter for many.
But each rainy season, floodwaters swallowed more and more of the beautiful tree-covered land. The boy's precious island was shrinking, eroding away with the rushing river, leaving empty sandbars behind. The boy witnessed animals stranded on those sandbars, their homes destroyed. He feared that if animals withered without trees, people would too. The boy shared his fears with the village. The elders explained that the only way to help animals was to create new homes for them. They gifted the boy with 20 bamboo saplings. Alone, he canoed down the muddy river. He wished he could cover all the land with trees. But a large sandbar nearby was a place to start. The land was too barren for animals, the shores too sandy for leafy trees. Would bamboo grow? The boy hoped. Determined, he began to plant. One shaft, two, then three. Every day, he watered the saplings by hand, sweat trickling down his face and chest. He built a watering system to help and lugged heavy buckets from the river. His arms grew tired, his back sore. Still, each day he tended to the plants and, over time, the bamboo patch grew into a healthy thicket. The boy was proud of his work, but he worried it wouldn't be enough. To stop the swelling river or to provide shelter for animals. If he wanted more plants to grow, he would have to create a richer soil. The boy carried cow dung, earthworms, termites, and angry red ants that bit him on the journey to the new home. He brought seeds from neighboring villages over trails, through brush, down the river. Each day, he planted. As years passed and the boy grew, so did a forest. 10 acres, 20 acres, then 40. Wildlife returned for the first time in many years. Buffalo, one-horned rhinos and snakes, gibbons, migratory birds and elephants. The man's forest teemed with life and diversity. Not everyone was happy. Fear swept over the villages when tigers arrived. So the man planted more grasses to attract small animals that would keep the tigers happy in the forest. 
elephants wandered into neighboring farms to feast on the crops. So the man planted more fruiting trees to help feed the hungry elephants. Some wanted to harvest the forest to build homes. But the man was there to plant anew. Others tried to hunt the animals for their horns and fur. But the man was there to protect. Few thought the forest would last, but the man believed in its strength. Now in India, on a large river island, among wildlife and trees as tall as buildings. There lives a man who has planted a forest. The forest is called Molai, after a man named Jadav Molai Paying, who never stopped planting and pruning and protecting. Only by growing plants, the earth will survive. Jadav Paying. The mozzie with the sharp snozzy. I am a mosquito. And I love it. Um, but I didn't always feel that way. I lived near a pond, down in the meadow where the most beautiful butterflies fluttered all day long. Everyone adored the butterflies. And me, most of all. One day, I built up my courage, took a deep breath, and approached the butterflies. Can I flutter around with you for a bit? I asked them. But they laughed at me and flew away. I didn't want to give up, so I flew after them. I found them bouncing up and down on the daisies. Why can't I flutter around with you? I asked the butterflies. You are not good enough for us, I said. Look at us. We are so pretty, so smart, so fast, so adorable. <laughs> you are ugly and boring. I walked away, not wanting to fly. I was too embarrassed to spread my flimsy wings. They were right. They were. 
was just a useless mosquito. And I hated it. a butterfly. Suddenly, I had an idea. Butterflies once again. I didn't ask them anything this time. I just fluttered around with them. I am a butterfly from over the hills, I finally said. Butterfly in the neighborhood, and I have come to join you. You are very pretty indeed, they agreed. And then, whoosh! When the darkness lifted, things were about to go from bad to worse. I had to act quickly. I didn't care about being pretty. <laughs> I didn't want to be a butterfly anymore. to be myself. I zoomed out of the jar and did what mosquitoes do best. Butterflies now want me to hang around, be their friend, and talk about how pretty we all are. But it's just not who I am. I am a mosquito, and I love it. Chapter One Who's There? Late, late at night, Mouse heard a sigh, then a scratch. Then a scrape. Then an odd little cry. She looked in the closet and behind the door. She looked in the cupboard. She looked in the drawer. 
She checked very carefully under the chair. It must be a ghost, said Mouse. Who's there? Chapter 2 A Plan The next day, Mouse told her friends about the sounds in the night. You need a trap, said Wren. I'll spin a web, said Spider. With any luck, the ghost will get stuck. Bunny said, I'll bring peas to spread on the floor. The ghost will trip or maybe slip. Turn out your lights so the ghost cannot see, said Mole helpfully. It won't work said Goat. Woo -hoo! Chapter 3 Setting the Trap So that night, Mouse hung the web, spread the peas, and turned out the light. And late, late that night, Mouse heard a sigh. Sigh. Then a scratch. Then a scrape. Then an odd little cry. Mouse hopped out of bed, excited to see what she had caught. But she slipped on a pea. Whoa! She fell into the web and got stuck like a fly. This plan does not work, said Mouse with a sigh. Chapter 4 A New Plan. I told you so, said Goat the next day. For catching a ghost, that's not the way. Then tell us what is, Mouse said to Goat. Please. Of course, said Goat. The best way is cheese. Chapter 5 Catching the ghost. So that night, Mouse put cheese on the table and behind the door and under the chair on her shiny new floor. Then she hid in the closet as quiet as a mouse and perked up her ears to the sounds in her house. And she heard... Nibble, 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 slurp. Slipper, slapper, slobber. Boop. Chapter 6. Caught. Mouse switched on the light. There in her house was the skinniest, scraggliest, scruffy young mouse. His coat was all matted. He had a black eye. His whiskers were sticky. Miss Mouse said, 
Oh, my! Please, miss, said the mouse. Don't send me away. I don't have a home. If you let me stay, I'll wash your windows and scrub your floors and make your bed and paint your doors and... <sighs> Calm down, said Miss Mouse. Of course you can stay. When you've had a bath. What's your name, anyway? Malachi Gimcrack, he said. Call me Mac. Chapter 7. A Happy Ending Such a snug little house for two mice together. In rain and in shine, in all kinds of weather. Old friends and new friends come over to play. And this mystery ends with a party. Hooray! <laughs> Put it on crackers. Put it on bread. Cheese goes best with friends, Goat said. Soldier with arms strong and warm. My papa is a soldier, and sometimes soldiers go away for a while to help for a while so I can stay and play. But if I could. I'd ride in Papa's backpack and whisper in his ear. <laughs> I'd ride with Papa side by side, so when he goes, I'm near. ride the storm and side by side we'd find our way. Yeah. 
He'd hold my hand. He'd touch my hair. He'd kiss my face and eyes. Me and my papa. Papa, papa, pa. Me and my papa. Papa, papa, pa. My papa is a soldier with arms strong and warm. My papa is a soldier, and sometimes soldiers go away for a while to help for a while so I can stay and play. But if I could, I'd ride in Papa's backpack and whisper in his ear. I'd ride with Papa side by side, so when he goes, I'm near. Near the bank of the river, one warm spring day, a new life began, and her name was May. Hmm. Mama held May in a warm, tender hug, then said goodbye to her sweet baby bug. You have your whole life, a day, perhaps more. Don't waste it, May. Use your wings and explore. Her delicate wings were feathery light. With a flit and a flutter, May took off in flight. There was so much to see and so much to know, but a dangerous thing was lurking below. It was big. It was hungry. It needed to eat. A newly hatched mayfly would make a great treat. Disguising its dark and deceitful sneer, it pleasantly said, Come closer, my dear. I have something here that you really must see, but you're too far away. Come closer to me. A voice inside her warned, May, don't go. But May didn't listen and swooped down too low. It sprang from the water, and that's when May saw two rows of sharp teeth and a menacing jaw. It snapped its mouth tight to gobble up May. But she ducked and she darted and somehow got away. Oh. 
May found safety in the hollow of a tree. She covered her eyes and tried not to breathe. Her body shuddered at the thought of Trout. I'll stay here forever. I'm not coming out. But when her heart slowed, May heard a sweet sound. Peeking out slowly, she looked all around. A robin nearby gave a cheerful tweet, then flew to her babies with something to eat. The mist on the river was a fine pink cloak. A bullfrog bellowed his morning croak. May noticed the beauty of a web in the sun, the glittering silk the spider had spun. Mama was right. There's so much to see. I can't live my life inside this tree. So May launched herself from the dark, hollow place. A greeting from the sun put a smile on her face. Hmm. May followed the river along as it flowed. She saw cattails swaying and a stubby toad. And bounding along without a care, Two cubs following Mama Bear. There were bluebells in clusters offering up for Hummingbird a cool drink from their cups. A newborn fawn on wobbly knees. And then in a clearing, May could see. A singing, dancing jamboree. A wild mayfly jubilee. Joining in, May danced with glee. The day rambled on and shadows grew long. Nature was singing its afternoon song. May floated along on a warm, gentle breeze, when faintly she heard a desperate plea. With shaky wings, she followed the sound, but May stopped cold at what she found. Snagged in a mess, his body still, the only movement from his gill. May inched closer, slow, unsure. Afraid again, he'd lunge at her. The trout was weak, no flip or flail. Tangled line had caught his tail. May's eyes lingered on Trout's jaw. But this time, there was more she saw. The snag had taken all Trout's fight, yet his colors shimmered in the light. Rainbow stripes in every hue. Silver, pink, and shades of blue. May saw a scar where once he'd fought to keep himself from being caught. 
And when her gaze met Trout's scared eyes, mm, we're not so different, May then realized. The fear she had felt, mm. May now forgot, and she quickly started on the knot. The knot so tight. Her progress slow. But then, at last! The line let go! The river carried Trout away. May wondered. Will he be okay? The silence was broken with a startling splash. Scanning the river, May saw a flash. Breaking the surface and catching the light, Trout flipped his tail and waved good night. And then an echo on the wind that blew. Two simple, precious words. Thank you. Her spirits matching the river's glow. May settled in for the nighttime show. Crickets and bullfrogs played their sweet tune while fireflies twinkled beneath the full moon. The stars came out early for sweet little May. She counted each one, then called it a day. The Little Heroes, Inventors Who Changed the World. Kai Loon. Little Kai liked watching wasps make their delicate nests from strips of bamboo. AD 105, Kai gathered tiny pieces of bark, old rags, and fishing nets. He mixed them together, pressed the mixture flat, and dipped it in water. When the sheet dried, presto, Kai had invented the first piece of paper. Johannes Gutenberg. Like a new star, it shall scatter the darkness of ignorance and cause a light heretofore unknown to shine amongst men. Little Johannes lived at a time when hardly anyone had books because it took too long to write out copies by hand. Around 1439, Johannes sent metal letters down in a block. Adding ink and paper, Johannes created the first printing press. He could print thousands of pages in no time. Ideas started spreading around the globe. Leonardo da Vinci Learning never exhausts the mind. Little Leonardo was curious about everything. He watched, he measured, he wrote, he wondered. He drew plans for machines that became real hundreds of years later. Like a submarine, bicycle, 
and helicopter. With his greatest tool, a paintbrush, Leonardo invented ways to paint that made him the most famous artist in the world. Thomas Edison. Our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed is always to try just one more time. Little Thomas was always reading and asking questions. One question was, why must I use dirty, smelly gas lamps to light my home at night? He began to tinker with light bulbs. In 1879, after hundreds of failed attempts, he finally found a way to keep one lit. Now people all over the world use electricity to see in the dark. Louis Pasteur. To know how to wonder and question is the first step toward discovery. Little Louis lived when no one really knew why people got sick. Using his microscope, he looked and looked and looked for the answer. Finally, Louis discovered something no one else could see. Germs! He found that if you boiled the germs, they went away. In 1885, Louis learned that germs could protect people too. Since then, Louis' vaccines have saved millions of lives. Marie Curie. Nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Little Marie loved to study elements, materials that come from the earth. She tested a special rock until she found a strange glowing blue light. What could it be? Marie had discovered a brand new element, radium. Doctors soon found that radium could fight off deadly cancers. In 1903, Marie was the first woman to ever win a Nobel Prize. The Wright Brothers. Isn't it astonishing that all these secrets have been preserved for so many years just so we could discover them? Little Wilbur and Orville were brothers who liked to tinker with machines. One day, their father brought home a toy helicopter that flew. They wanted to fly too. They studied the wings, the tail, and everything they needed to know about flight. Crashing never discouraged them for long. Finally, in 1903, they flew the first airplane. Grace Murray Hopper. If you've got a good idea and you know it's going to work, go ahead and do it. Little Grace loved learning about math, science, and cool gadgets. Once, she took apart seven alarm clocks just to see how the gears worked. When she got older, Grace figured out how to program a room-sized computer to respond to human language. 
not just number codes. Now people all over the world can use computers every day. These heroes imagined and invented a better world. What kind of hero will you be? Change the world. Blossom the cow. In 1796, Sarah Nelms and her cow, Blossom, both became sick with a disease called cowpox. Some people said anyone who got cowpox once would never get it again. Dr. Edward Jenner wondered if giving a boy cowpox could help him be protected from smallpox too. The doctor tried and succeeded. Now thanks to Dr. Jenner, Sarah, and Blossom, the disease that once killed 300 million people is gone for good. Did you know? The word vaccine comes from the Latin word vaca, meaning cow. Sergeant Stubby. One day in 1917, a stray puppy found his way into the midst of World War I. A soldier named Robert Conroy fell in love with the little dog and let him stay, calling him Stubby because he was so small. Stubby learned to do tricks, like salute the soldiers, but he also did brave things that saved lives. During his 17 battles, Stubby alerted soldiers to dangerous gas attacks, helped medics find the wounded, and comforted injured men. Once, Stubby even captured a German spy. Did you know? In 1921, when Robert went to study law at Georgetown University, Stubby came along with him and became the school mascot. Share a me, the carrier pigeon. During World War I, before cell phones made communication easy, the United States used carrier pigeons to deliver secret messages across long distances. One pigeon was called Cher Ami, meaning dear friend in French. Cher Ami carried 12 important messages during the war. On his last journey, although he was badly injured, the little pigeon successfully delivered a message that led to the rescue of 194 missing soldiers, known as the Lost Battalion. Did you know? During World War I, the U.S. Army enlisted the help of about 600 carrier pigeons to deliver secret messages. the bear. (laughs) 
One day, a soldier named Harry Colburn came upon a beautiful black bear cub being held by a trapper. Harry felt concerned and bought her from the man for $20. was a soldier heading off to war. The bear, whom he named Winnie, after his hometown of Winnipeg, sailed with him on a ship to France. Before long, Winnie became so big, Harry had to take her to the London Zoo, where zoo-goers were allowed to feed and play with her. That's where she met a boy named Christopher Robin. The friendship inspired Christopher's father to write Winnie the Pooh, which has been a favorite children's story around the world since 1926. Did you know? The real Christopher Robin actually had a teddy bear he named Winnie, along with a stuffed donkey, pig, tiger, and kangaroo, which inspired the characters Eeyore Piglet, Tigger, and Roo. Togo the Sled Dog. In 1925, a terrible sickness called diphtheria broke out in the tiny Alaskan village of Nome. The town was too remote for planes or ships to access during the winter. People were dying, and more were getting sick every day. The only team that could quickly bring the life-saving serum was a group of Siberian sled dogs. Although a dog named Balto led the final team of the relay to deliver the serum, Togo was chosen to lead the longest and most dangerous stretch of 261 miles. Running through snow, crossing frozen sea, Togo and the other sled teams completed a relay of about 675 total miles to save the village of 1,400 people. Did you know? The trip to deliver the serum to Nome got as cold as minus 85 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 65 degrees Celsius and took seven days with drivers who, at times, could not even see the dogs in front of them because the weather was so bad. Sea Cat Simon. In 1948, a ship in the British Royal Navy was docked in Hong Kong when a sailor smuggled a cat on board. The other sailors adopted him too, naming him Sea Cat Simon. Simon was injured in an attack, but he never lost his special ability to comfort wounded sailors and boost morale. Most helpful, Simon wiped out a major infestation of rats on the ship, protecting their food supplies and keeping everyone on board healthier. The sailors, grateful for his efforts, hailed Simon a hero. Did you know? When Simon returned home to Great Britain, he became an instant celebrity and received many letters from adoring fans. Abel and Baker, the Space Monkeys. In 1959, two monkeys named Abel and Baker were chosen for a special mission they were going to outer space. On their rocket, a Jupiter missile, 
Abel and Baker flew into the sky, 360 miles above Earth, at more than 10,000 miles per hour. They safely arrived back home to Earth, proving that mammals could survive spaceflight. Thanks to Abel and Baker, scientists had the confidence to move forward with space exploration, sending a man to the moon, launching an international space station, and studying the possibility of life on Mars. Did you know? Two years after Abel and Baker returned, the first human, a Russian cosmonaut, launched into space and orbited the Earth for 108 minutes. Coco, the Signing Gorilla. In 1971, a gorilla named Coco was born. A student named Penny Patterson wondered if Coco could learn to communicate with humans through sign language. Coco surprised everyone by learning more than a thousand signs. When her pet cat died, Coco showed her ability to feel by making the signs for cry, have sorry, and Coco love. Coco forever changed our understanding of how much we have in common with our animal friends. Did you know? Coco's full name was Hanabiko. Japanese for fireworks child, because she was born at the San Francisco Zoo on the 4th of July. These animals all change the world for the better in their own unique ways. What will you do to change the world? Marvelous Cornelius, Hurricane Katrina, and the spirit of New Orleans. In the quarter, there worked a man known in New Orleans as Marvelous Cornelius. Morning, he saluted the silver-haired man with the Times Picayune tucked under his arm. Greetings. He waved to the couple with the baby on the balcony. Ma'am, he nodded to the woman, shaking rugs out at her front window. And when his truck rounded the turn, my youngins, he called to the kids crowding the corner. Marvelous Cornelius, they cheered. Marvelous Cornelius. At each home, Cornelius sashayed to the curb and shimmied to the hopper. Unloading the garbage, not a single Pauline wrapper ever stayed on the streets. And those spotless streets, oh, how they sparkled. Woo, 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 woo. 
He called to his driver when it was time to stop. Rat-a-tat-tat, rat-a-tat-tat. He strummed the side when it was time to move. Hootie-hoo, hootie-hoo. His favorite call of all, showtime. Cornelius front flipped to the curb and flung the bags over his head, behind his back, between his legs. Into the truck. He lined bags along the curb and then launched them. Bag after bag after bag after bag after bag. They landed in a perfect pyramid inside the hopper's metal mouth. Bang! He clapped the covers like cymbals and twirled the tins like tops, whizzing and spinning back and forth across the street. And just like those twisting tops, Cornelius danced too. Tangoing up to loose, sambaing down St. Peter, rumbling up roar, cha chaing down charters, and everyone danced along. The old ladies whistled and whirled, the old men hooted and hollered, the barbers, bee twirlers, and beignet bakers bounded behind the one-man parade. But then one day, the storm came. The great city filled with water. People and pets, parks and playgrounds washed away. Schools and shops, streets and streetcars washed away. For far too long, water, water everywhere. A gumbo of mush and mud. When those waters finally fell away, Cornelius looked out at the mountains of ruins, some as high as the steeple atop St. Louis Cathedral. It would take thousands of me to clean this, he wept. Millions. Cornelius rose. He dried his eyes, for his spirit and will were waterproof. And just like he did every morning, he emptied the garbage into his hopper. And the kids who crowded the corner, <laughs> they pitched in too. So did the silver-haired man, the couple from the balcony, the woman with the rugs, the old ladies and old men, the barbers, bee twirlers, and beignet bakers. Others, too, from Brooklyn and Boise, Baltimore and Bakersfield, Syracuse, Seattle, Santa Fe, San Antonio. They streamed to the Crescent City. Thousands, millions, a flood of humanity. Hootie hoo, marvelous Cornelius cheered. Tee 
as the great city rose again. Marvelous Cornelius, he passed on. But as for his spirit, that's part of New Orleans. New Orleans forever after. A boy like you. There are billions and billions and billions of people in the world. But you are the only you there is. And the world needs a boy like you. The world needs a boy to be kind and helpful, to be smart and strong. Maybe your strong is making sure everyone has a chance to play. Maybe your smart is knowing the precisely right, perfect pass to make. Oh boy, be you, the you that makes you feel most alive. Play hard, but play fair. Be a great teammate. Say, nice goal, and good try. Don't say you throw like a girl, ever. And remember, there's so much more than sports. There are vegetable gardens to grow and flowers to give. There are cakes to bake and eat, too. There are instruments to play and songs to sing. There are stories to read and stories to write. There are science experiments to do and math problems to solve. Oh, boy, be curious. Take a risk and raise your hand. Smart kids ask questions, so ask a lot of them. The more you know, the less you'll fear. Here's a secret that not many people know. Fear and bravery are partners. You can't be brave without first being afraid. If you're not ready to be brave, ask for help. This shows you're smart. Sometimes you may feel like crying. Cry. This shows you're strong. One day, you'll be a man, and men cry too. Oh boy, dream big. You are unique, and your dreams are yours to dream. It's okay to not know exactly what you want to be or what you will become, but whatever you become, become a good one. And remember this about dreams. You don't get what you wish for. You get what you work for. So work hard for what you want. In this world, you will meet all kinds of people. And all of them are different. Ask people to tell you their stories. Then listen. Listen hard. Stories connect all of us. They're part of what makes us who we are. Don't forget to tell your own story, too. 
As you travel and come and go, hug your family and high five your friends. High five your family and hug your friends. Walk with your head up. You'll want to see where you're going. Smile at people and say hello. Leave every place you visit better than you found it. And leave every person better than you found them. Say please. Say thank you. Say I love you. And if that's not exactly right, simply say, I like you. And maybe most importantly, say, how may I help? <laughs> Helping each other is the best way to make our world stronger. Oh boy, be thoughtful. Eat lunch with the new kid. Hold the door for the person behind you. Do the right thing, even when no one is looking. And most of all, be you. You'll discover that the best you is the you that is all you. Not a little you and a little someone else. You are original. And that's a wonderful thing. And always remember, the world needs a boy, a smart boy, a brave boy, a kind boy. Oh boy, a boy like you. Friends book. Bang, boom, brave. A story about bravery. Mouse was scared of thunderstorms. One evening, the skies rumbled. Bang, boom. Mouse scurried back to his house underneath the three round rocks and hid under his blanket waiting for the storm to pass. Morning came, but the storm roared on. Bang! Boom! So Mouse stayed in his bed. Night fell, but the storm roared on. Bang! Boom! So Mouse stayed in his bed. Three days passed and the rain continued. The storm grew louder and louder each day. Bang! Boom! Bang! Boom! Bang! Boom! So Mouse stayed in bed, never moving, only shaking. That night, Mouse thought, I must be brave or I may never leave my bed again. He peeked out from under his covers. He looked left, he looked right. He saw pots and pans on his kitchen table. Mouse tiptoed out of bed. He grabbed a pot in one paw and a pan in the other. He crashed them together. Clang, bang, boom. He crashed them even louder. Clang, bang, boom. Clang, bang, boom. Clang, bang, boom. Mouse could not hear the storm over the sound of his pots. I'm louder than the thunder, squeaked Mouse. Mouse looked out of his hole. The rain had stopped. 
the clouds had cleared. Mouse was delighted. I scared the storm away, he exclaimed. He was very proud of himself for being so brave. The End A Forest Friends Book Mouse's Superpower A Story About Empathy Raccoon found a comic book in the forest. He was sharing it with the forest friends. They were thinking about superpowers and what theirs might be. For some, it was easy. I can fly in the dark as quiet as can be said Owl proudly. And I can swim like a fish, said Otter. Bunny was fast. My power would be super speed, she said. Mine too, added Fox. Bear was big and strong. I would be a giant with super strength, said Bear. But some of the forest friends were less sure. Mm. I am not sure what my power would be, said Raccoon. Oh, don't be silly, Mouse said. You would be a great and clever inventor. Raccoon liked that idea. I can fly, said Bird, but so can Owl and Bee. That's not a very special power. She sounded frustrated. Oh, but Bird... You sing the best songs. You can make anyone happy. That is a great power, said Mouse. Bird cheered up. Bee looked sad. He hadn't thought of a single power for himself. I'm too small to be a superhero, he said. Mouse was small too and knew just how Bee felt. You can turn pollen into honeycomb and honey. It's like magic. None of us can do that, said Mouse. You're right, said Bee. I have magic powers. Let's not forget about you, Mouse, said Owl. Me, said Mouse shyly. Yes, said Owl. Your superpower is being the best friend ever. All of the other forest friends agreed. Mouse had the best superpower of all. The End Little Princess makes a splash. Part One, The Bathing Suit. Little Princess. Little Princess runs. Little Princess runs to the park. Little Princess goes in. And out of the locker room.
little princess runs fast. In and out and all about in her bathing suit. Where is she going? <laughs> Little Princess is going to the wading pool. Part two, the pool. Little Princess is ready. Little Princess puts on her swim cap. Her friends are in the pool. Everybody is waiting for Little Princess to jump in. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> Jump! <laughs> Little Princess and her friends swim and splash. They are happy. <laughs> they shout, Happy Swim Day! <laughs> the end. Berlin, the immigrant boy who made America sing. Irving stood on tiptoe to see over the rail. Behind him, too far to glimpse, was Russia, where angry Cossacks had burned his family's home to ashes. Ahead was America, what would they find there? Suddenly, people pointed to a strange green figure in the distance. Was this the famous Statue of Liberty? The passengers whispered. Then, a melody rose and flew to her like Noah's dove in search of safe land. Shema Yisroel, hear, O Israel. Irving's heart lifted and soared. His thin, high voice joined in, gathering strength with each note. The statue seemed to welcome them. God bless America, his mother said. God bless America, Irving whispered. He could hear the statue singing her own special song low and warm. One day, Irving promised himself, I'm going to write a song just for her. Life in America was strange. Instead of his small shtetl with dirt roads and wooden houses, Irving wove his way through crowded sidewalks. Big buildings blocked the light. Carriages rumbled down streets, and a crazy, thrilling metal contraption called an elevated train clanked and whooshed overhead. He still heard Yiddish and Russian, but now it was mixed with English, Italian, and German from all the different people who had come to America. Music was everywhere. 
Irving sang in the synagogue with his father, who had been a cantor in Russia, the one whose voice carried people's prayers to the heavens. Walking home, the melodies in his head mixed with the crack of stickball games, the wail of the ragmen, and the creak of cartwheels on the cobblestones. Back in his family's crowded apartment, there were more sounds. The steady treadle of the sewing machine in the apartment next door, the thump of his mother kneading dough, and soft laughter when his father pressed his cheek against her flowery face. <laughs> Irving lay awake, late at night, trying to fit all the notes and words together. When Irving was 13, his father died. Still a boy, Irving quit school to sell newspapers, earning pennies to help feed his family. Ashamed of being another mouth to feed, he scrounged scraps and slept in a dirty tenement with hundreds of other ragged homeless kids. Even there, he was always listening. Snatches of jazz, bits of lullabies, whispered jokes. One day, while he was selling papers, he couldn't stop the notes swirling in his head. He burst out singing. People stopped, smiled, and tossed him coins. Irving stared at the bits of copper glinting in the sun. People were paying him for music? Would they do it again? He tried singing popular songs on street corners. Irving didn't have the strongest voice, but his hummable melodies and catchy rhymes made people smile and stick around for more. People threw enough coins that a passing restaurant owner noticed and offered Irving a job as a singing waiter. A real job, making music. Irving wanted to write the melodies he heard in his head and felt in his heart, but he didn't know how. So every day after the restaurant emptied, he slowly tried to pick out tunes on the old piano. At first, he was terrible. But slowly, he got better. People noticed. When a singer at another restaurant wrote a hit song, Irving's boss asked him to do the same thing. Irving still didn't know how to write down music, but the restaurant's pianist did. He helped Irving write Marie from Sunny Italy. They sold it for 37 cents. At 19, Irving was a paid songwriter. Word spread about the talented singing waiter. Irving was hired to write words for songs by the Ted Snyder Company. But he wanted to write the melodies too. He sang tunes to a pianist and paid him a few cents to write down the notes. Four years after his first sale, Irving wrote Alexander's Ragtime Band. The song was so catchy, so irresistible, it became an international hit. Years later, stars like Al Jolson, Louis Armstrong, and Judy Garland would perform it. People all the way in Irving's native Russia went wild dancing to it. Irving wasn't a waiter anymore. His songs made a lot more than pennies. Now he and his family were never hungry or worried about how to pay rent. But even after he moved to a fancy apartment, Irving would walk a few blocks to his old neighborhood in the Bowery, where he could listen to the rhythms of the street, the sounds that would fill his music. When the United States entered World War I, the Army put Irving to work, writing patriotic songs. He wrote an entire Broadway musical for the soldiers called Yip Yip Yaphank. 
His mother watched proudly, wishing his father could hear the applause as Sergeant Berlin sang, Oh, how I hate to get up in the morning. Every night, the audience roared as Irving and the 300-person cast marched down the aisles and out the door, singing the final song, We're on our way to France. On closing night, the soldiers marched out the door and onto the troop carrier, which took most of them to France, for real. Twenty years later, when the United States was getting ready to enter World War II, Irving wanted to help his country again. He picked up a song that he'd originally written for the World War I show finale, but never used. It ended with three notes from the Shema, as he remembered hearing them on the boat coming to America long ago when the statue had smiled at his prayer. He blended the melody with his mother's words, God bless America. At the end of the old melody, he added new words about the land he loved. Irving showed the song to his friend, Kate Smith, the famous singer. Would she understand what he was trying to say? Kate hummed the notes, read the words, and nodded. From the mountains, to the prairies, to the oceans white with foam, Americans all over the country huddled around their radios, listening to Kate Smith sing God Bless America. On the eve of the dark days of World War II, the song filled them with hope and courage. It still fills people with hope and courage. Over the years, Irving earned a lot of money from songs like Always, There's No Business Like Show Business, and White Christmas. But he never took a penny for God Bless America. Irving gave everything the song earned, millions of dollars, to children in the Girl and Boy Scouts. It was his thank you to the country that opened its arms to countless people from all over the world, including a homeless boy who came to America with nothing but music in his heart. If you don't have books, what are you waiting for? It's a kid-safe, ad-free library full of storybooks that are brought to life. Ask your grown-up and start exploring more fun stories like these. Seriously, you have to check it out. Thanks for watching. For more stories, try the Books app for free today.